Hey there guys, good morning. Our problem for today is pretty challenging, despite the concept being rather simple. Essentially, we're going to drop a ball onto one end of a bar in order to launch another ball of equal mass up into the air, kind of like this. All that we need to do is figure out how high that launched ball goes. And to get that height, we'll need to go through a process of five different stages. And here's an outline of what those stages are. Unfortunately, we can't skip any. Let's get started with the first one and pull up the energy conservation equation. The left-hand side represents dropping the ball at the initial height from rest. And the right-hand side represents the ball striking the bar. Dropping the ball from rest means there's no initial kinetic energy, so let's throw that piece away. And since there was no mention of anything like air resistance or other dissipative forces, we can ignore the other work term as well. Over on the other side of the equation, if we say that the ball and the bar collide at y is equal to zero, then the potential energy term can be eliminated too. So with this approach, there's just a single term on both sides. And here are the definitions for those. Notice that we have mass on both sides of the equal sign. Let's divide that out and work towards solving for V. I'll multiply both sides by two and take the square root. However, we need to be careful here. We can't use a positive square root because that represents an upwards velocity. And that doesn't really apply to an object that's falling down. So instead, we're going to use the negative root. And now that we have the downwards impact velocity, we can move on to stage two, which is to use this stage one result to get the ball's angular momentum. To do that, let's introduce a new vector equation. Here we have the angular momentum vector on the left, and it's equal to the cross product of a position vector and the momentum vector. Recall that the definition of momentum is mass times velocity, so we can rewrite this equation using that definition, like this. To complete this cross product, I think it would help if we bring our picture back into focus and center a three-dimensional coordinate system on the bar's pivot point. Our first vector, the position vector, is directed from the point of rotation at the origin to the line of action of the force that acts on the bar. And that force is the weight of the falling ball, which will end up hitting the very end of the bar over on the right side. Let's label the positive distance from the center of the bar to the edge on the right as r. This way, we can represent the components of our position vector in terms of r. To get those components, let's take the difference of the coordinates of that vector's tip and tail. The tip is the first quantity in brackets and the tail is the second. To simplify this, we will subtract like components, but here we're just subtracting zero from everything in the first set of brackets. So that doesn't really do much. We just end up keeping the first piece as a result. Moving on, lowercase m refers to the mass of the ball, and our velocity vector is represented here in green. We'll do the same tip and tail difference to get its components. The velocity at the tip is the impact velocity from stage one, and the velocity at the tail has zero in every component since the ball was released from rest. And we can simplify this difference really easily as well. 
Notice that our equation at the top uses a quantity of mv rather than just v. So to get that, we multiply each component of the velocity vector by m. That's it. It's really that simple. To get a hint of where the angular momentum vector is pointing, we can curl our fingers on our right hand along the clockwise path of the bar's rotation, like this. And our thumb will indicate the direction of L. Based on this drawing, the L vector points in the negative Z direction, into the screen. And so, if we do our cross product correctly, we should get a result that matches this. Let's see if we're right. Here's our table of x, y, and z components for r and mv. Starting with the x component of the l vector, we want to ignore the x component column and multiply red with red and blue with blue, like we've seen before. Down below, we take the red product minus the blue one, and the overall expression will end up reducing to zero. When we take the same approach for the y component of L, we find that it also ends up reducing to zero. So that's good. We're on the right track. Then finally, doing the same for the z component of L gives us the following. And when we simplify this, we end up with a negative result, just like we predicted. And now that we have that value, we can move on to the third stage and use this z component with another angular momentum equation that we've seen before. I'll be a bit more specific here and add some subscripts on both sides. Let's plug in that z component over on the left and show that the system that we're referring to in this stage is the sum of the bar and the two balls together. And since we weren't provided a radius for those balls, we can't really treat them as spheres. So instead, we'll have to resort to using the moment of inertia expression for a particle. Just make sure that you end up multiplying that by two to account for both of the balls. We want to take this expression and solve for the angular velocity of the bar. So let's divide both sides by everything inside the parentheses over on the right. And that's the end of stage three. In stage four, we're going to use this equation relating linear and angular velocities but it needs a couple changes. Since we already have v referring to the downwards impact velocity, let's call the upwards launch velocity v up. And we were previously referring to the angular velocity of the bar as omega bar. So I'll stick that in there too, so that we remain consistent. Let's also not forget that the ball being launched upwards is located to the left of the origin of our coordinate system that's found at the pivot. This means that our launch ball is not at a distance of positive r, but rather negative r. So we'll need to replace that in the equation up top as well. Once we take care of that, we can plug in the value of omega bar from stage three. And here you can see that the negative signs in that product cancel each other out, and we get a positive upwards velocity as expected. Before we continue, let's simplify that ratio over on the right and absorb the outer r into the numerator, like this. We're now ready for the last stage, stage five. To get that launched ball's final height, we can take advantage of the conservation of energy equation once more. This time, the initial side represents the moment right as the ball is being launched upwards. 
and the final side is when it reaches that maximum height. Starting from the left, we have our launched ball being propelled from y is equal to zero. So the initial potential energy term can be thrown away. Same goes for that other work term. Once the ball reaches the final height, all of the kinetic energy will be converted to potential. So let's get rid of that term too. Once again, there's only one term remaining on both sides, and that makes things nice and easy. Let's plug in our definitions and divide out the mass on both sides like we did back in stage one. If we also divide both sides by g, then we get the final height by itself over on the right, and we can stick in our expression for v up into the numerator on the left and square it. And rather than having a fraction buried within another fraction, I'm going to rearrange this so that we end up with just a single ratio over on the left. And now everything is defined in terms of numbers that we know. So we can plug our values in and stick it in a calculator and see what we get. On my end, the result is a final height of approximately 1.87 meters. And now we're done. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great day.